Welcome back, everybody. Excuse me, I keep forgetting. Welcome back, everybody, to Voice October 2023, where I interview various veterans of the voiceover world. My next guest uh, is someone who I have been following the work of for about 25 years. You probably know her best as the voice of Mokuba from Yu-Gi-Oh!, a whole whack of Pokemon characters, uh, several gym leaders and creatures such as Bulbasaur, Oddish, Yamper, and Larvitar, just to name a few. Uh, she starred as the lead character Chase in Fighting Foodons. She's Biscuit in Hunter Hunter. She's been in animated series such as Barbie, Generator Rex, Phineas and Ferb, Ninja Turtles, Tom Hanks' Electric City. Uh, she's been heard in countless audiobooks and radio commercials. Uh, she was an on-camera co-host of Cartoon Network Friday's block in the uh, mid-2000s. And she runs a very cool Etsy store called Looped LA. And all of that is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to your career. We have Tara Jane Sands today. Hi. <laughs> I, I want to bring you with me everywhere I go. And I want you to say that. <laughs> just be your walking, talking uh, marketing campaign. <laughs> yeah, like even like before I walk into Trader Joe's. Um, just announce me like that. Yeah, absolutely. Is that, then is that weird? Like, yeah, is that no, weird? No, 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 not at all. And bless okay. you for that. You're already catching on very quickly. Uh, thank you for making time to talk with me today. This has been lovely. Um, Hell yeah. Yeah. I, I think we, we met like right around when I first moved to LA, uh, mm -hmm. of which you've been kind of back and forth through. I want to talk about that. Uh, cause you've been kind of all over. Um, so to start with. I, when did uh, you move here? Uh, nine years ago, as of this past summer now. So. Oh, I was already here, like planted here at that yeah, point. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I, I, I always like to, to, as I say, often bust the generic crap out of the way. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna learn some new things because I don't. <laughs> yeah, know, let's do it. I don't know your, uh, as I often call it, your tragic backstory as to how you got uh, inducted into wanting to be a performer. my origin story. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, so bring us back, paint us the picture of. Uh, a younger Tara and how uh, the the performance bug bit you and, and led you to uh, where you are now. I feel like if it was like Wayne's World, it would be like, and there'd be like squiggly <laughs> lines. And then you see a young Tara running through a grass field. Uh, OK, I'll give you the condensed because I feel like please, people please. are sick of hearing this. Yeah, <laughs> uh, maybe they're not. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I grew up uh, in New Jersey, like really close to, to the city. And uh, I'd always, you know, I'd always wanted to be an actor. I was doing classes and as a kid and all that. And then in high school, I was in a local singing competition at the Y. And maybe you've heard of it. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And uh, there was a talent agent as one of the judges. And they brought me into their offices like the night I came in second place. And uh, they brought me into their offices and they were like, yeah, we'd like to represent you. Talk to this person on the phone. And it was a voiceover agent and i i did not know what a voiceover was they're like and i guess i just talked to them for a few minutes and they said yeah we're sending you on this voiceover audition and uh it was for compound w warped cream and i oh. had to say <laughs> yeah i had to say something like ew gross a wart and i got the job and it was my first audition for any kind of voiceover again i didn't even think about this because i was a, i wanted to do theater uh so i yeah i booked the job and i i loved i went to the recording studio and i was like this is so cool and my mom was like you got paid for that uh and she's like you're going to college soon and you know you could start making money i guess uh <laughs> and no she actually i don't think she said that um she probably thought it uh so yeah i started doing voiceovers and i loved it i was doing a lot of commercials uh i started doing some audiobook work um whatever they would let me do. Then I went to, to college, studied theater. When I got out, I just, again, just auditioned for every single thing I could. And somehow, not even actually sure how, I ended up on Pokemon, and that was my first anime job. Oh, really? Um, okay, that I didn't yeah. know. I thought you had done some other stuff before that. No, um, a lot of the Pokemon folks had. They'd done a bunch of like Central Park Media stuff. Uh, and uh, they kind of knew each other from that. Mm. I was new. Okay. I, I, and again, I still don't even know. I, I don't remember auditioning for Pokemon. I don't, I must have dropped a demo tape off somewhere. I, I was literally like pounding pavement, dropping my voiceover demo cassette tape off at as, at as many, you know, or mailing it to as many places as I could. So my guess is that that's how I got the job. Were but you, I'll never, uh, I don't think I'll ever know. Were, were, you, were you still going to school at that point? Or were you like, by that point, just like full on, like. I was working? out, I was not long out of school, but I was out of school. Got, yeah. Okay, gosh. Gotcha. Yeah, because I know that there were some people that were like still in school or just out of school also, or like working other, you know, 
random jobs, like acting related or otherwise, yeah. kind of those early days and stuff. So. Well, Lisa, Lisa Ortiz and I were college friends, oh. and she had taken some time off, and I had heard she took some. We were the same year, whatever, but she took time off. I got out early. So I had heard she was doing some anime stuff. So mm -hmm. she had started Slayers already by that point. So yes, I kind okay. of, honestly, my knowledge of anime was that my friend Lisa, who I'd kind of lost touch with at that point for a little bit, was doing something called anime. Like mm -hmm. that, was, that was my knowledge base. And that Pokemon was a show that gave kids seizures in Japan. That was, <laughs> that was my knowledge. Of the, and Speed Racer, I, I knew Speed Racer. Sure, so like, sure, sure. That was everything I knew about anime. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, because uh, now also in, in those earlier points when you were like, oh, okay, I guess I'm I'm doing this now. Were you also already going out for uh, on camera stuff as well in, in uh, New York and New Jersey and stuff? I was doing, I was living in, this, in New York and I was just, I was going on every audition an actor could go on. I'd wake up yeah. for musical theater auditions at five in the morning and get online at the equity building. I was doing like off off Broadway theater at night. I was going on commercial auditions. Uh, I maybe started a little bit of audiobook work at that time, but not a ton. I mean, commercials were, I was, I was working a temp job. I mean, we all had a million jobs at that mm. point. Um, I was making balloon animals at birthday parties on the weekends. Oh my God. Um, wow. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was just, and I was, I was doing like auditioning for student films. I was just, it was just whatever you could do, you know, yeah. like. Yeah, I this was all I wanted to do. So literally just at that, at that point, voiceover was just one of those, you know, th the 700 different avenues of, of things you could find. It was, you know, because but then I feel like it was it was shortly after Pokemon, because I think Yu-Gi-Oh was the next kind of already big, big thing that four kids got. Yeah. And then yeah. It, and then suddenly it was like, oh, here's about 800 shows and you're going to be on all of them as like 18 characters. That's what it felt like. It, you know, it's I've been well, well, we can talk about this later, but I've been doing a very deep dive into four kids. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And their growth was it felt like overnight. I mean, in the, in actuality, so four kids for whoever's listening and doesn't know four kids was the company that acquired the rights to Pokemon to bring it to the U.S. Mm -hmm. And I. I guess other some other English speaking places I don't know, but our version was heard in a, in in Australia, New Zealand, and other yeah, English England speaking and Canada places as well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I'm actually trying to fa find out how those rights uh, mm. were acquired. But yeah. um, so the Four Kids was this company. They were a licensing company started in the 70s. Uh, I think they would have been 50 this year. They were called Leisure Concepts Inc. So they were a licensing company. Then they started doing some production. They brought over Pokemon. And that was such a huge hit that they started expanding rapidly. So uh, they were like, this anime. They had done a little bit of dubbing before that, but um, were some production stuff. Uh, so yes, it exploded. I mean, literally, uh, walls were being knocked down at the, the office they built so they could make more room. Um, and then they built their own studios. And I mean, at the height, it was probably at least 10 shows going on at once. There. Oh, yeah. No, I, I went dubbed. and all, all my New York centric guests I've had in the past. Uh, I, I always often ask about like, you know, the, the heyday when it was like that many shows oh, on, on awesome. Kid WB and Fox and, you know, whatever else it was insane. But even even in the earlier days, too, I, I, I always joked about whenever I would go back and I'd watch like season one of Pokemon and like, you know, they'd have of which you were many, many, many of those, you know, little one off <laughs> episodic characters, but it's like, all right, this one is Tara. Next episode, it's Amy Birnbaum. Next episode, it's Megan mm -hmm. Hollingstead. Next episode, it's, you know, Lee Applebaum or who it was like the five, yeah. five same people <laughs> over and over oh, as everybody oh. in the world. <laughs> totally. And I mean, I think, well, there's a couple reasons I think for that. Mm -hmm. Um, one, what we were like a repertory company, like that's sort of how I looks at us. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, they didn't know that like sometimes our po that our Pokemon at the beginning, like when I was when I was assigned Bulbasaur, mm -hmm. it was because I was playing another role in that episode. Yeah, they didn't know that those characters were going to keep coming back. So I think it was a lot of like, oh wow, uh, Tara's Pokemon characters are in this. Uh, let's we're paying for her, so. Um, let's have her just do this other thing while she's here. Uh -huh. um, they also knew like what they could trust us with at that point. They were kind of like, okay, we know that if they're in the booth, they can cover this and this and this. 
because there were so few of us, they knew, you know, they knew our skill set pretty well. Mm -hmm. And I was just reminded that we were paid $40 an hour when Pokemon started. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. So when I say save money, it's not like they were saving a lot of money. Right. <laughs> um, but uh, um, yeah, I mean, that was so cool because we could like, you know, go from show to show to show. I, I assume it's like what Crunchyroll or Funimation feels like now. Mm -hmm. um, like a real repertory company. We all knew each other because it was New York. We could all, we all hung out, not all of us, but most, a lot of us hung out. We're still friends. Um, it was a really, it was just a cool time to mm -hmm. be. I mean, it was the same as like the girls that I would do the same commercial auditions as. Like, yeah, we would have the same, like, three or four auditions a day. Like it was busy then like radio commercials there were tons of radio commercials. So we would just like hang out, go to lunch, go from audition to audition. And, and that is, that doesn't exist today. I'm, I feel yeah. really lucky that I got to experience it uh, and sad that it doesn't exist the same way. Yeah. When I, when I kind of, um, you know, started, I mean, very, very minimally in New York because Pokemon was my first job as well. I, I had just Aww. kind of missed, um, I, I'd missed the boat a little bit on like, you know, that, that heyday of everything. I only ever had one Yu-Gi-Oh! audition at four kids when they had kind of unfortunately lost all their, you know, other properties and things by that point. Darren was very nice. But I know that, like, everybody in that kind of generation of, like, the four kids' heyday, like, and even now, like, it seems like everybody's very tight with each other and everyone's very sweet. When I see you guys on panels together, everybody, whether it's Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh! or whatever else. And uh, I think it's really cool. I think it's cool that, like, it became kind of this little... And especially because, you know, the up until more recently, the, the New York scene was a little bit more... Um, privatized you know even even regardless of like social media stuff it's like a lot of you guys didn't do a whole lot of you know appearances and cons and signings right, and right. stuff like that that was that was a very uncommon kind of thing for that scene but now never, yeah now but, it's yeah, yeah now it's <laughs> but now but, so but everybody knew of who all of you were because we were hearing you in everything on saturday morning <laughs> all the time so we we were in your living rooms um, yeah, that, you know, honestly, I think those people just hadn't been approached. Everyone was like, oh, they don't want to do conventions. And it's like, oh, no, no, they just didn't know. Um, yeah. I was here. So I, you know, I was, I tried to help bring a lot of those people into the fold when I could. And I think I, I don't want to know spoilers, but there's a few people you're going to see at conventions soon. I think you're going to be really psyched oh, about. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, I was very happy about, um, cause actually I, I did an interview with him. Oh no, no, of course. Thanks to you. I forgot about this. Uh, Mike Hagney. Uh, who Aww. is wonderful because of the the, the, the signed um, uh, Pokemon Gen 1 starter trading cards that you and him Aww. and Eric Stewart were doing together, which yeah. was fantastic. Oh, so. those are, we still have those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah I mean, and Hagen, it's been great. I, you know, Hagney, I introduced to my agent, and now we get to do a lot of, uh, of these conventions together, and that's mm -hmm. been so cool. It makes, it makes these things more fun. Mm -hmm. I mean, we do all do genuinely like each other but i think there's also like some kind of trauma bond we share like <laughs> being part of I, I i don't know how else to explain being part of um something so big that none of us expected to be so big you yeah, know that yeah and again that's i don't want to use the word trauma bond lightly and i you know i'm joking obviously but but again it was a weird time to be part of something so huge um not feeling necessarily great about the the contract we signed i think that bonded us um and then being all let go at the same time from that show yeah i was gonna say although you know because of not everybody but you are among several by now as the ash series is, is about to wrap up in the u.s i mean you're one of several people that came back to the show to do many other characters and i think even maybe even some that you had done before maybe later I, on? No, I wasn't. So Megan was, Megan Hollingshead was able to come back as Nurse Joy. Yeah. Um, my, it's, it was like a weird thing with, if, if the characters had, had had a new voice actor and obviously I would never take a, a job from someone like that who had, who had been doing it for longer than I had done the job. Sure, sure. Um, so I got to play some new characters, which was really fun. Right. Um, and obviously, again, working with Lisa, again, like, we've known each other forever. Yeah, was, I know, I know, weird full so circle cool. after all that time, so. Yeah, I so amazing, and um, it's all different, you know, for whatever we feel about how all that went down, it's all different people working at the Pokemon company now, mm -hmm. so it's not like we're working, you know, <laughs> we can't blame these people for for us not being part of the show all this time, So, mm -hmm. which is good, because it's, 
it's new new folks yeah. um yeah it it's it just i was already gone from new york when the recast happened right okay. so i wasn't you know for better or worse i just didn't know the details of it which mm -hmm. is why like i've been asking people how that went down because i i honestly didn't know i i mean i've heard like five different stories about why and from different people with different perspectives about things and i'm just sort of like well you know well, what? i can I mean, we're tell you on. what i th i think yeah. i've gotten to the bottom of it and okay. um i because i'm doing this podcast about four kids mm -hmm. i i had always thought that four kids was the one preventing us from um continuing our roles on the show mm -hmm. and that was not the case uh Ver veronica talks about on the podcast uh how she four kids actually tried to help them get their roles back and, and tried to encourage them to write to the studios and whatever but the roles had been recast already by that point so mm -hmm. it was a decision either by the po pokemon company or by whatever studio it was going to mm -hmm. um and not a contractual issue so okay. so that was in, that was new to me um again maybe we'll interview someone who has a different version of that story but i thought it was important to to talk to the people who were actually there because just like you i've heard i've heard multiple versions and i'm yeah. we're trying to get some definitive like oral history of four kids <laughs> no it is because i mean i've seen other people that i mean frankly weren't there uh and with no offense to them because i'm sure they're just concerned at, and and maybe fans of it but i've seen a lot of like quote unquote documentary videos oh, about yeah. that and I'm just like, uh, I don't think that this is fully accurate of what was going on. But that's a that's And a again whole it's thing. it's not malicious there's nothing malicious about it. It's yeah. just misinformation. And that's why like everybody I mean I have a list of people I want to talk to for this podcast and it's I think I have over seventy people on this wow. list. Okay. <laughs> because I want to talk to everyone behind the scenes. That's mm -hmm. who knows these shows better than us, the actors. We didn't know the what went into making changes on the shows that people are angry about and why they had to do that. And I I wasn't involved in those decisions. And mm -hmm. I feel bad at conventions when I get asked questions and I can't answer them. Yeah. So. Well, especially because, like, you know, there's, there's people that fall into the different sort of categories of, like, I did both the early era and the later era. And, like, I worked on some of the, like, you and I were both in... Um, Pokemon Generations, which was that little mini oh, yeah. series. Uh, we, uh, was, yeah, yeah. Was, was that Deluxe? I think we did that at, right? That um, sounds right. Yeah, yes. and that was that was an that was a whole separate continuity. It was that whole thing too, you know. Um, well, I, actually, kind of connected thing because uh, it's funny. I, one of one of the early parts that I remember you for uh, was Richie because um, I had those, those early episodes on Did tape. I make you cry? I'll, yeah, a little bit. I, for, okay, for multiple reasons. And I was actually happy he came back a little bit later on, too, a few times. Um, I uh, When for, did he come back? Uh, I think in, the, in the, the gold and silver stuff, like a few years later, he was in some other episodes. Oh, but not, right? like, recently. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no kept, not more recently, yeah. We kept hoping he was going to be in like one of the final ep uh, seasons because it would have yeah, been cool to see him nice. and Ash reunite. Yeah, yeah I was hoping. yeah. yeah. Um, well, cause, cause one of those big things, what I recall from, I would, I would so immediately recognize you from him. And then from when Mokuba, when, when Yu-Gi-Oh happened a couple years later. And then I, yes, I did watch some fighting food on <laughs> at the time. I did watch a couple episodes of that show. Um, uh, one, one of your big iconic kind of, uh, character voices was your little boy characters. Yes. Um, was, <laughs> was, was a go-to. Yeah. <laughs> well, what, was that something that you kind of discovered on the fly in in that kind of early you know 2000s late 90s era of doing stuff like was that something that you had played around with before or was that like oh i i guess i can do this and oh i i'm good at this and they're having me do this a lot for these shows it's a good question i i remember in college doing like a, a funny like one of those like i remember being annoying with that voice mm -hmm. but i never thought of it as like i'm gonna do cartoons one day mm -hmm. and it the day that it hit me was my very this i mean I talk about this all the time. It was my very first day of recording Pokemon, and I got there early because I'm always early. Mm -hmm. And uh, Veronica Taylor was recording before me, and luckily they said, "Oh, go watch her finish at working." And I didn't know I didn't know how to dub. I didn't know anything. So mm -hmm. thank God I got there early. And I see this beautiful pregnant woman in the booth <laughs> doing the voice of <laughs> doing the voice of a ten year old boy, and I was like, "Oh, I want to do that." Mm -hmm. That's so cool. She's amazing. Um, and that's when it sort of occurred to me that, like, I think I can do that. Uh, and that was, uh, yeah, I was there to play 
uh, Melanie that day in the Bulbasaur and the Hidden Village <laughs> episode. So I was cast as as Melanie, and they were like, "Uh, you're here. Um, we we're done early. Let's you look at that little blue guy and that little like." thing with the bulb on its back. It was that uh, easy back then. Isn't that so bizarre that it was just that simple? Not easy, it, but it was just that simple back then. I mean, hey, here's simple. another character for you. <laughs> yeah, but they didn't know that those characters were going to recur. I know, so yeah. in their mind, they were like, let's finish this episode. It, yeah. was, it was like, you know, Michael Hagney, I'm sure he said this to you, like, he's like, there's 150 thing of these things, like... Uh, they can't all be. episodes. Yeah, there's yeah, all gotta so be one. He, he thought it was like one or two per episode. So he it wasn't as if I was being gifted this thing. And they were like, see if you can do this. And again, I didn't even know if I could. I didn't know if I was going to be kept as that voice. Because they're like, see if you can do this and sound like the Japanese, but say Bulbasaur instead. Mm -hmm. So I left. And then I did Oddish that day. And yeah. I was like, uh... I didn't know if I had done a good job. I thought it was the weirdest show I'd ever seen. I was like, I'll never see those people again. Um... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, especially because I was like, well, what do they say? And they're like, Bulbasaur. And I was like, what else? And they were like, uh, that's it. I was like, uh, good, good luck. Um, Pokemon, ultimate Meisner technique, saying the same three <laughs> syllables or whatever, like a thousand times in every way humanly possible. So <laughs> insane. And and again, like, I don't want to, I don't want to, like, minimize that because... I think, like, I've had people say to me at conventions, like, you did the voice of Bulbasaur? I thought they just, like, got someone from down the hall to do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. They, uh, and I was like, yeah, I get, I, if I had been watching it, I think I would have thought that as sure, well. Sure. I, I probably, I get it. I'm not, like, offended. But mm -hmm. hopefully we added a little more. And there's some episodes where I think I probably added a little more, hopefully, nuance to it. And mm -hmm. some probably where it doesn't sound as interesting. Also, sometimes if there weren't a lot of cues with, like, the Pokemon themselves, I was told, uh, and again, maybe this isn't true, um, but I was told that if it was 10 or less, like, flaps or whatever, they would just pull our voice from another episode. So it might have not always matched up perfectly with yeah, what there, was going on. Yeah, there has on. definitely been quite a bit of recycling with when it comes to the creatures. That's that's happened a lot, yeah. for sure. Well, well, funnily and sometimes enough, that works, yeah. When, when it comes to that episode, well, a couple things. First of all, I, I remember reading on, like, you know, all sorts of websites – uh, that you were Bulbasaur, and I was like, I wasn't even sure if that was true. I mean, for one thing, because as I'm sure, <laughs> as I'm sure you've seen and maybe been on the receiving end of this, there is a lot of um, miscredits to four kids oh, actors so for many. a thousand different things. Uh, yeah. So I wasn't even sure if that was true, but also I did know for sure that you were Melody because I. <laughs> One of my friends and I at the time, I think one of the times we went back and we just like threw, went back when they were, uh, well, no, actually now I think even still those episodes are on Netflix, but we just threw that on. And we used to like kind of do like a joking impression of like, but Bulbasaur can't get to the thing. And like, Bulbasaur. <laughs> just like, we just did impressions of her and I'm just like, I've met her. That's really point. funny. <laughs> but, That's really funny. And I mean, I have to say too, like, I, I, it's a, it's a, uh, I don't want to sound ungrateful or. I was just learning how to do this on the job, right? So, like, it's not my best work. And it's crazy that that's what people have seen the most of. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you yeah. know, like, yeah. I'm like, I would redo that in a heartbeat if they'd let me. I, <laughs> I, I, I listened to a soundbite of something the other day from that era, from uh -huh. One Piece. My, And I was like, oh, I'm terrible. <laughs> and I... And I sound like I'm trying to fit the, the lip flap. Mm -hmm. Like, it, that's what it sounds like. It sounds like if I had done two more takes, I could have smoothed it out and it would have been fine. Mm -hmm. But when we were working under pressure and deadlines and rewrites and... Broadcast schedules for everything, because all the yeah. stuff you were doing was not, you know, that wasn't straight to DVD stuff. That was... Uh, that was we're going right on air. I, I, I always even talk about the fact that, you know, when, when people have... Okay, I'm going to get sour grapes for a second. When I see people complain about, oh, simul dubs, and oh, we don't have time, and I'm just like, bro, do you understand that all the four kids people, and especially on Pokemon, where those were airing, like, so soon after they were recording, <sighs> as I've learned, it's like, you guys were doing the original simul dubs or broadcast dubs yeah. or whatever. I mean, oh, we were then, being... We were being faxed new pages of scripts as they were being written and we were in the studio. That's how fast everything was happening. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, and, and it wasn't as if, you know, we could just email these. <laughs> like, it was literally <laughs> a fax machine. And the translator was in one place and the writer was in, it was, it was bananas. Yeah. But I, I do wish that 
um, I had been a little bit more of a seasoned, uh, uh, I mean, I just was young, you mm -hmm. know, I had trained, but I wish I was more proud of some of the work I had done there. Some of it was fine. Sometimes I listen and I, I don't, I, I also don't like listening to myself, so I'm a bad example, but, yeah. but I can admit if something's good. Um, and some of the stuff I've heard lately, I was like, oh my God, why am, why is this the stuff that I'm the most known for? Why couldn't they have seen, uh, that play I did? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I know, like, I know. There's always the proudest stuff. It's like, yeah, it was in this obscure thing or just like, you know, you would have had to be there or whatever. But if it, if it aired on TV and every child on planet earth watched it, it's like, yeah. that's how it, yeah, I know. I know. Uh, I just, again, I, I attribute, and, and there are people doing great work there. I don't, you know, I don't think, I think it was like a, I think we were all learning on the job, but there were people who are obviously more seasoned and especially more seasoned in dubbing. I'm like, you know, when I look at that Melanie episode in Bulbs, I'm like, well, I guess for my first day of ever dubbing in my life, that was okay. Yeah. But it's not, I'd really love to redo it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just wish I was prouder of some of the stuff, but. Well, it's funny because this is, this is jumping learn. way ahead, but I do remember when um, Electric City came out and I was, uh, I was, oh, who's in the cast of this? And it's, okay, celebrity, 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 and then, like, a few voice actors, and I saw your name, and I was like, oh. And then I looked up that your character, I think, I, I think if I'm not mistaken, your, your central character in that was a little boy. And I'm like, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. she was always really good at that and the anime <laughs> stuff I watched, so. <laughs> well, I, I can even explain to you how that even happened. Sure. Um, my friend produced that show. Uh, she had just moved to L.A. Mm -hmm. I was uh, doing scratch track of, like, every character oh. uh yeah, yeah i had done scratch of a ton of stuff uh for them i was just doing favors you know mm -hmm. i was just meeting people i had moved here not that long before mm -hmm. um and then you know it came time for auditions and casting and, and i was like hoping i got to like retain some of the the big roles that i was doing scratch track for and i was like oh no no gene Triplehorn's doing that role i was like oh <laughs> okay <laughs> they're like you'll be roger and i was like great happy to do whatever um but I can't even believe, so I guess we should explain what Electric City is, because I think you're like the only person that knows that, except for people who have listened to the podcast Dead Eyes. Oh, okay. Well, it was it was an animated uh, miniseries uh, produced, I, I think, or, cre or created by created, Tom Hanks. Created, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And starred him as the leading character. A very cool animation style. Kind of reminded me of like something like an Archer, which I think was either before or after that show. Uh, really, it cool was like his kind of passion project. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It was on like Yahoo or something like that. Yeah, right? yeah. I was yeah. just talking. God, I was just talking about it today. It was on Yahoo, and it just, it, it didn't. It just, it was almost like it didn't exist. Like mm. no one heard about it. It was such a. It was so sad, and I don't really know. And it had sort of gone away for a while. And then there's a podcast called Dead Eyes, which, if you haven't listened to, I just I recommend it to anybody. I think anybody in any walk of life can understand it. It's about disappointment and uh, and in your artist career, but it just relates to so many people. And yeah. I don't even want to give away the premise, but it's very Tom Hanks related. Mm -hmm. um, and I was listening it. I was listening to it one day and all of a sudden the, the host of it was following me on Twitter. And I was like, that's weird. Oh, my God. Like, it's like he knows that I'm listening to him. And then I realized, oh, right, I was in that Tom Hanks project. <laughs> so I actually got to be interviewed on his show, on Dead Eyes, because of that project, which to me was almost more exciting than being in Electric City because I was fangirling over being on my favorite podcast. Wow. Yeah. What, what, I mean, I was are, excited about Electric City, obviously, but. <laughs> why is our world so weirdly small? It's so fucking weird. <laughs> like, so weird. It's um, so weird. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, I, I, I don't want to talk about the, the, the L.A. transition before that real quick, doubling back for just a quick second. I know we were talking about a lot of things from just kind of that time period, but um, from from working on so many of those shows with. Hakeney and when you know Eric Stewart was directing a lot and like mm -hmm. Chris Colay and then Darren mm -hmm. later on and um, <laughs> who else Tony Salerno a lot of those guys it, wackiest or weirdest or funniest or strangest like memorable kind of story <laughs> from from that time working with all those dudes on those different four kid shows yeah they are all dudes you're right uh I think they have like <laughs> one or two female directors yeah um I remember. I mean, it it was 
A lot of the funny stories are not about the shows themselves. They're no, about the funny sure. yeah. shit that happened. Like, like I remember like Taryn and I always talk about this. One time I was in the booth and I, I guess I was playing with the mic cord or something and I fell. <laughs> I don't oh, know what no. happened. <laughs> but yeah, Taryn was like, what happened? I, and you have to understand too, these booths were like tiny. Uh -huh. And I think I looked at him and I said, I was pushed. <laughs> like, there's ghosts like, like, in here. <laughs> yeah, like just dumb crap like that. Like I remember like at one point, I think Jim Malone was directing me and we had ordered mm. food. And I remember having like daring him to like eat as many mustard packets as he could. Like just dumb shit. Like I... <laughs> I don't really remember the shows. I remember, like, one thing I do, like, I remember singing for Fighting Food on, and, like, that stayed with me pretty clearly. I remember the, <laughs> oh, I remember a bunch of us from the cast going to see Pokemon Live. Oh, yeah. Musical. Yeah, at yeah. Radio City Music Hall. That was pretty special, and that's how we met Darren and Andrew Rannells. Yes, they were that's in right. The show. That's right. Um, so, yeah, like, I wish I had funnier, like, anecdotes about the shows themselves, but <clears throat> excuse me um a lot of it is just like about either like the parties or the like uh, yeah i can't i'm i'm trying to think if there were like funny rewrites like we would leave each other notes in the script yeah 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 um i remember <laughs> i was telling a director this recently and i won't name names but mm -hmm. an engineer sorry and uh one of my lines in the um in the episode i don't remember what show this was mm -hmm. but i had to say please do me this favor and in that annoying voice and uh the engineer took that and just cut out the this favor and on a loop it just said please do me please do me please do me <laughs> yeah and every uh, time i walked into the booth to record with that person they played that for me of course uh yeah, yeah. don't don't and ever say anything in front of a microphone well, you don't want i know to well it. <laughs> it was well it was my line in the in the show yeah, i mean yeah, this yeah. was dialogue yeah. yeah i mean i didn't have a choice uh, but it did i did remember like oh that's the power of pro tools uh, yeah, like huh? Note to self, they can, like, you know, I'll say my lines, but let me be careful with everything else I say anyway, just in case. Um, but, yeah, no, I mean, it was legitimate dialogue. <laughs> and, it, and it was funny. I wasn't upset by it at all. But it was like, a, that was like a funny thing. Like, that was an ongoing joke, you know? I, I do recall uh, a couple things, actually. I, I, I've never told you this. Um, but but uh, you're going to learn something about my sort of uh, mm. peripheral view of you from back in the day. One, I remember recognizing you on the radio. Uh, I recall specifically, I think there was, I could not remember what the campaign was, but I think I heard you and Greg Abbey maybe together on huh. some kind of radio commercial. It might have been. Uh, but right away I was like, oh, Mokuba and Tristan. Okay. How you know, funny. But, yeah, yeah, because I was already becoming my little weirdo uh well, uh, you have uh, a good ear. I don't have a good. I don't have a good ear like that. Like that's really impressive to me. I, I'm, I'm just envious. A freakish that you... Rolodex of yeah. Anybody can tell you that. And then the other thing was this has to do with the the transition to L.A. I remember in probably by the time probably by like the early 2000s, I was becoming my walking talking voice actor encyclopedia of anything and everything and having that ear for stuff. And I remember watching a certain little show that Bang oh, no. Zoom did in the early 2000s called Baroni Kenshin. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it was, I knew that it was an L.A. show, and all of a sudden this character Sojiro pops up, and I'm like, that's definitely okay. Mokuba. I'll explain. And that's New York. But, that, but I remembered that was, this was before the Cartoon Network uh, yeah. uh, Fridays thing, which which we'll get to that. And I then it, suddenly I was hearing you in every LA thing. Okay, But I'll then explain. suddenly Sojiro was somebody else after a few episodes, and I'm like, huh. But I never, for, I, ne I kept forgetting to ask you about that every time yeah. I saw you in person, so please. It's a good question. So I was I lived in LA for six months okay. in 2000. Okay. Uh, and just to kind of check it out, and my intent, you know, I was, thinking about staying, but I decided to go back to New York in August 2001, mm -hmm. and then 9-11 happened. Ooh. And my intent had been to go back and forth. Right. Like, that was always my, I was like, okay, I'm going to be bi-coastal when they need me for Rory Kenshin or whatever it is, like, I'm going to make it work. Mm -hmm. And then after, and then 9-11 happened, and I, I just wasn't, you know, we weren't, like, hopping back on planes, and I was yeah, like, I'm yeah. going to stay put. Um, and also in that six months in LA, I just, I was, 
it wasn't the right time. Like I was, I realized I'm like, I'm not ready yet. I know, I think I'll end up doing this, but the timing wasn't right. And I felt really crappy um, doing that to, to companies. Like if I had worked for them, like I, I didn't, I had, that wasn't my intent to bail. Mm -hmm. um, and I felt, you know, I felt crappy about that. And I, I think I put them in a shitty position by having to, but I, but also after 9-11, people then understood like, oh, okay, yeah, you're not, you aren't running back here. Yeah. Um, and I was actually grateful that I was not to bring down the podcast. I was grateful to be back home when sure, all that sure. happened because yeah. I could see my people and I could know that they were okay. And I think I would have been more scared and upset if I hadn't been there. So, yeah, well, and I, and I know, um, cause I, uh, you know, Dan Green has talked about this in other, uh, some other interviews and things before. I know that that was, you know, tricky and bizarre because I think that was around when you guys were recording Yu-Gi-Oh! Like in yeah, the early yeah, definitely. days of that. And that, cause I even remember the first episode uh, with your with your one line, big brother for two seconds. Uh, I remember <laughs> help, help. That's probably I, I, <laughs> every other episode. Yeah. Um, I remember. I think it was pushed back. Like the premiere of it was pushed back on Kids WB because WB was airing, you know, news oh, about wow. the towers and everything at that time. Because I think it even aired maybe on Cartoon Network like before it was supposed to air on WB or something like that. But I, oh, but that's I so interesting. But I remember that was like, oh man, how are we supposed to get through doing this show while, you know, our <laughs> our state and our country is going through this right now? It was just a, it was a strange thing for, I remember, yeah. I know, for the crew to kind of cope with at that time, for sure. Well, I, um, I look at New York, like, and again, and not to keep talking about my pro my podcast, but that's, <laughs> I'm looking, because we're talking so much about four kids, I yeah. look at New York as such a, a, a component yeah. in that whole time. Like, I, I again, like the nine, that 9-11 happened during all this, that it, during the height of a lot of this, um, yeah, like New York was just another character in the show. Like yeah, so much yeah. our friendships and all that stuff, I feel like it, it was because we were in New York and you would walk to the subway together or you would grab coffee or beer easily together. Mm -hmm. uh, and it and led to like, you know, the difference is, is that when I would jump in the booth and I, I would dub something there, I would usually know the other voices I was hearing. Like if they had recorded before me. Mm -hmm. Now there's so many more people like, you know, I stopped asking like, oh, who's that? Oh, who's that? Like there's some once in a while that happens, but nine times out of 10, I don't know who it is. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, uh, yeah. So it's, <laughs> I liked that because again, or if I knew who I was working off of in a scene, even if they hadn't recorded, I, I knew that I could picture them. Sure, sure. Which made the dubbing alone process not as daunting and, or I could anticipate their read. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that happens with a longer show. When you're doing a show for longer, you kind of get people's rhythms and stuff. But for anything that's supposed to be comedic, you you need that. It's so hard to not record together. So it helps to know them. Well, and especially I have to imagine when you started doing a lot more uh, original animation stuff. I know, I think, was Turtles the first of those? Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Was Angel, is that her, is that her name? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, little punk girl, I remember her. Um, I, I imagine that that must have been such a creative. I don't know if you did. Oh, uh, it's food, the best. Food, uh, uh, what was it? Pinata was it? I don't know. If I didn't do it. Uh, no, I was gone by then. I think. Gotcha. Um, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I, I was left again in two thousand five. Um, yeah. So that probably was was then, but well, the well, turtles well, was well, the well, moving, best. Moving to LA though, and I mean, because yeah, like I, I pictured, like I was suddenly I was hearing you and stuff. I I do remember immediately recognizing you by your voice when you were doing the the Cartoon Network co-hosting stuff, and I'll never forget. There oh was, wow! There was one day I think they aired uh, Pokemon two thousand. Yeah, uh, and I wasn't. They didn't want me to say that I was in it for some. Yeah, reason. but I was. But I, the whole time I was like. There's so many easy jokes you could make with this yeah. right now, but you're pretending like you're not I <laughs> acknowledging <don't>, that. <laughs> I don't know what the thought process was behind that. Uh. I, I, yeah, you know what? I would love to ask them if there was a specific reason. I mean, I'm the only person that would get a job on camera at Cartoon Network and be wanting to be on the cartoons instead. Like, I love, I, I should clarify that. I loved that job so friggin' much. Yeah. That was the best job I'll ever have in my life. Honestly, it was great mm -hmm. but i also wanted to be on the cartoons i was like what <laughs> don't they do they know that i do voiceovers like it was almost like i don't they didn't care that i also did that like mm -hmm. it just wasn't a component like, again i did some of you know when i would do the promos and that kind of stuff that was helpful that i knew how to to do that but mm -hmm. 
it was so weird to me that I couldn't be like, I'm in that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. This. <laughs> so weird. How, uh, wh- when, when it was like, okay, for real, for real, I'm, I'm staying here. Um, how was the transition? In LA, you mean. Yeah, I, I, okay. I know that like it's it's a different experience for everybody, but I imagine I mean you had so much stuff under your belt by that point. Did that make it a little bit easier, or was it? Really yeah. Fresh? Well, I I I moved here with the Cartoon Network hosting. So yeah. So yeah. I guess I should clarify. I hosted a show called Fridays on Cartoon Network, which was on Friday nights. We were basically in between the. We were during the commercial breaks. It was me and Tommy, and we would act silly and tell you what was coming up next. Mm-hmm. Um, and so basically that job shot in Atlanta. Oh. So they were going to fly. Me, yeah, they were going to fly me in from uh, wherever I was. Mm-hmm. And it, so I was basically like, you know what? Ha- if I'm going to go to L.A. And there were a bunch of extra shoots for that show that would happen in L.A. And I oh, I knew okay. there was the, the possibility of maybe them only using Tommy if I if they didn't want to fly me out. And I was like, I feel like if I'm going to do this, this is the right time. And moving to L.A. with a job everything's different. I mean, people treated me differently that yeah. time when yeah, I moved yeah. with a job. Uh, it, yeah. I mean, even, you know, professionally, they just did like, like there's your, the desperation is not in you, which, um, I, Jason, I listened to Jason Bateman's podcast, Smartless, and he always says it's like sexy indifference. Um, you know, when you don't, when you don't, I, I know, and I know he's like making fun of the term, but like, it's like, you know, people smell that desperation on you. And yeah, like, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. yeah, I had my job. Like, I was like, okay, cool. I go to Atlanta for like a week, a month. And otherwise I can audition for this other stuff and I'm good. I can pay my rent. And it was just a different way to come to Los Angeles. No, and for sure. Everyone. Yeah, no, that yeah. that is a really good cir- circumstance. It is certainly a rare one, but it's because it's one thing when you move and you have a bunch of work under your belt. It's one thing when you move with a bunch of experience and a bunch of credits under your belt and also like a job that is basically there already. One that, you know, went on for, it was a couple of years. I think you guys did that, right? Two years. Yeah. I was, I was the uh, replacement. So they did it for about a year. Then I came in and we did two, two years. Yeah. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, yeah. But again, like come, you know, from the time I lived here, when I came out here in two in 2000 ish, thousand ish, I shouldn't mm-hmm. enunciate cause this is a podcast. <laughs> uh, um, I, I had already been making a living in New York doing voiceover and then to not be making, you know, not then to be like struggling here was hard. You know, mm-hmm. I was like, it's a new city. They don't know me. I, you know, it's, and you know, I see a lot of younger actors today, like upset that they have all these other jobs and stuff, but it's, that's just the way it's always been, yeah. you know, like I picked up other jobs when I moved here, you suck it up. It's you humble yourself. I'm ready at any given moment to have to like find another job. Like I never feel any job security in this industry. I, I think also in the note also of, of, you know, when you're moving from one end of the continent to the other, I mean, like one of my buddies who was on uh, one of the later Yu-Gi-Oh series uh, when he moved, uh, they made it work and he was able to continue right. doing the rest of that series. But I mean, I, I, I remember when that Car- didn't when, happen until much later. Uh, no. Yeah. And I remember distinctly when Carrie took over for Mokuba. Yeah. I yeah. Was like, oh, yep. I did. Well, that makes sense. Cause I know she's not there anymore. Like I, I knew that by that point. And um, I know that like, for back then when, you know, bef- the, before the time of home recording and, 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 you know, dubbing from home, especially it's like, you know, I know that can be kind of a scary thing too, of like, well, I'm leaving jobs behind. I have oh, one yeah. year, but I'm leaving other work that, that was consistent for a while behind too. Yeah. Um, Megan Hollingshead and I discuss, yeah, we talk, we go into this on the podcast. Mm-hmm. It's like this known entity, but it wasn't as if, I mean, again, I, not to be whiny, but like, we weren't being compensated what we should have for it. So it wasn't as if we were leaving our stability behind with that show, sure, but sure. we also knew we were really lucky and happy to have it. Cause we enjoyed it. Um, you know, we left at that, I, at that point it was Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh. There were other shows there, but I think like fighting food ons had ended and mm-hmm. Shaman King had ended. Um, so w- those were the two things that her and I were leaving behind. Uh, and it was, you know, it was bittersweet. You know, part of me was like, good, get someone else. I don't need it. <laughs> you know, and, and and I love Carrie and I'm glad that's who it was. Mm-hmm. Um, 
who took over, like people were like, were you mad? I was like, no, I moved. Good mm-hmm. for her. Like, great. I'm happy she got it. And then all those um, years later, coming back for the movie and then the, the couple video games and things as well. <laughs> well, yeah, because cool. she had moved too. So it was like, <laughs> all right, well, now you've both moved. So yeah. pick, pick one, yeah. Exactly. Um, so technology just, you know, helped with that. It would have, again, it would have been a, the first time I think four kids let someone record remotely was when Sam Regal moved to LA. Yes. They let him do the turtle stuff yes, remotely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but that was different too, because it wasn't dubbing. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you, you reminded me, I'm foolish and did not mention Shaman King in my grand introduction How to you, because that's dare one of my you? favorites. It's one of my favorite roles <laughs> of yours. Uh, and uh, I have not gotten to check out uh, the entirety of the remake from last year, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah a couple years ago. Um, what, one thing I got to point out, and this was even something I noticed in Kenshin and then also the other stuff you were doing out here, because, and I want to be respectful with my wording of this, um, yeah, yeah. the style of acting for the four kids shows was, you know... One for type Satur- of thing, you know. <laughs> it was for Saturday morning. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It was and, Saturday morning acting. Yeah, 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 totally. And and then you know to do other anime is a totally different kind of beast. But when I would hear, in fact, you know, actually speaking of Megan and Sam and you, when I hear you guys, you know, doing shows in L.A. and it's like, oh, I can tell that's the person that I heard on those Saturday morning for kids shows. But this sounds like a real human being. That's that that to me as just as a viewer that was wild yeah. to hear, uh, and also like you know the NYV you know stuff that like Michael was doing and everything as well that was its own thing too. Um, for for was that was that a challenge for you in the anime world or was that just like oh no this is just a different it's just a different style and I can just yeah it's it's all dependent on the show uh, or was it kind of like a culture shock thing of like oh. I'm not in I'm not in Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh land anymore. <laughs> yeah, and that's a good question. I mean, I think I think when we recorded those, and again, it depended on the director and what and all that. But we knew that show was targeted to a little kid. Mm-hmm. Um, we and we recorded for that. And again, I people had had different um, amounts of knowledge about anime in general and mm-hmm. about you know a lot of these people. It was like their first time directing an a, a cartoon or, or anything. Um, and when I, and not the, and I don't want, again, I want to say this carefully too. It's yeah. not that we didn't take it seriously. It's that we kind of thought it was silly. Like, we're like, this is fun and silly, but we, it, it, we also, like, I didn't see the stuff that was cut out of this, these things yeah. that maybe yeah, made yeah, it yeah. heavier, you know? And I did, so I, I apologize if I didn't treat certain things with maybe the reverence they deserved. And, and again, I wish it, Shaman King was a perfect chance to go back and, do that and when i moved to la anime in general was treated much differently Mm -hmm. um there was a different kind of um seriousness taken with it was treated more seriously um yeah i it and it was interesting to me i was like oh oh okay and i you know you switch gears and luckily with anime you know maybe you hear some of the other characters and you realize okay tone is different but also just in general knowing this is not for Saturday mornings. The shows that were being done in L.A. were for people who were anime fans. Mm-hmm. And they want something different. They want it to be closer to the original style. They they are not the same. And the Saturday morning audience, we were just, from what I'm, I'm learning, four kids were just, we, they wanted to make it as palatable as possible for them. So it was matching the tone of Looney Tunes or whatever it was, like yeah. with heightened, crazy reads. Again, I'm not proud of a lot of those reads, <laughs> but but it, but they blended in. You know, I mean, you all had to sound like you were on the same show. Um, and it, I think obviously it worked because we're still talking about it. So for all its faults, it got kids to sit and watch. And maybe being that over the top was what helped that. I, I don't know. I, I, I'd be so curious to to have shown kids two versions of those shows and seeing what the difference was. Um, yeah, well, actually, it's really funny. Styles. You are reminding me. I totally forgot about this until now, but there's somewhere in my collection. I have the two dvds you have those i know what you're gonna say the uncut yep. uh, the attempt at an uncut redub of shaman king and Yu-Gi-Oh. i yep. have the only discs of those that they released uh yep. at the time and uh i remember that was so, I, I i'm sad because i feel like that was an attempt made too soon 
I think that because uh, I know they they bombed. I know no one bought them. I know that there was like little to no production value put into the you know just making them and the adaptation of them. And even to be honest, like some of the performances, I could even hear a little bit of the like we did this already. Why are we <laughs> doing it again? Kind of That's you funny. know reads, but yeah. Um, but Shaman King, I mean, like had the the best of that world in terms of they actually like reanimated the entire show and did you know because also i i often forget shaman king was one of the few shows that you guys did that you did the entirety of you know that was like a i think like, like 50 yeah. to 100 episodes of the, the original series and then the netflix one they they went past where the show cut uh -huh. off with the manga material and everything and we see anna and yo grown up and everything too and i i still um i don't know how much truly interest there is there now but i feel like with that um that last Yu-Gi-Oh movie we got a little a little bit of a taste of what it could have been like with with you and dan and eric and everybody but i still yeah. wish that we would get like you know like a dragon ball kai style treatment of like go back and do gen one Yu-Gi-Oh uncut or, or, or reanimated or something i would buy i would buy it like immediately I know. you know i think yeah i don't think you're alone so my my co-host on the podcast uh which is called four kids flashback mm -hmm. uh so steve yurko he the reason uh he's a great co-host is because he's he's you i mean he grew up watching this stuff um, and he has all the same questions. He has those two DVDs of uncut <laughs> uh, ep uh, episodes of Shaman King and Yu-Gi-Oh! And in every, almost every interview with uh, staff that we do there, he holds them up and he's like, what do you know about these? We're trying to find out more information about these. Um, and so far, no one knows anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's the unfortunate. They don't even problem, remember like, them. I, when I when I asked, like, I mean, when I asked Michael about, hey, you know, the the episodes that were banned, like this and that or whatever, and he's like, I don't remember if we actually had that. I don't remember if yeah. we, we did it at some point or whatever. Yeah, like that's the because I mean, I it was twenty five years ago, of course, and people moved on to different things. Like, what are you gonna do? Right, um, but yeah. I would have loved. I mean, I think what we really want to know is what was the meeting for that about? Like, hey, we're getting some backlash about the cuts, let's give the real fans what they want. And I love that it seems like there was at least an acknowledgement about that. And mm -hmm. I think that's when you talk to the people who are angry about the, the stuff, mm -hmm. um, that that could have been what saved it, you know, for them. And it's yeah. a shame that it didn't get more than that. But I don't remember doing that. I don't remember. Um, I don't remember recording it. Mm -hmm. And I and even like Jim, who produced Shaman King, didn't know anything about it. So mm -hmm. It's sort of this like big mystery where that's one of the questions we're trying to get answered. Mm -hmm. But I love that you're one of the people that have it. Like, yeah, no, I'm well, just because it, it fascinates me. I mean, even hell, I, I interviewed uh, privately. I talked to Chris Collet about uh, I was researching stuff about One Piece. And uh -huh. there's like a million characters because like the, the four kids One Piece dub has like a, a ton of actors that were not some of those, you know, regular 15 to 20 dudes that were in Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh that are doing cons that everyone knows of for specific characters. There were guys that were like, I was a stand-up comedian and like Chris had me do some one-off character and like I'm credited in this video game and like they don't <laughs> remember, Chris doesn't remember. So there's tons of characters in that dub that like no one knows who that was or they're yeah. miscredited to like to you or or whoever else. Like, like that oh, happened I was a lot. Getting... Yeah. I was getting asked to sign all this stuff for one piece that I knew I didn't do. And I was like, I can't in good conscience uh, sign this for you. Yeah. So like, I finally listened to a bunch of those. I, it took forever to get it corrected on IMDb because I just felt like I was disappointing people. And I was mm -hmm. like, I... I just don't want to charge you to sign something where I don't know if I did that or I not. I know, I know. Yeah, which, is, which, by the way, I respect that because some people would be like, "Yeah, totally, pay me your money." Because and that's oh no, happens, I can't. Which, I could yeah. never do. I, that makes me angry. But uh, yeah, and again, uh, someone we're supposed to talk to for the podcast was somebody who did the credits for the shows. Mm -hmm. So I can't wait to see what their limitations were and why they <laughs> couldn't give into. You know, I'm sure there's a reason. And again, I'm mad right now about it, but because I'm like, I want to know. But I'm sure. There was a very good reason why that couldn't happen, mm -hmm. and that's that's kind of the fun of of re of rehashing all of this for me. I'm like, oh, there was a good reason. Okay, I'm less mad, um, but I do wish that we had all kept lists of our characters. Like, I am so anal and annoying about writing down every character I play now. I do because... that every job I work. I do that every single job I work now so I don't forget. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I know I did a, I did keep a list at one point of the Pokemon and it's totally gone, lost and gone. <laughs> but I, like, and, and I just, I question like, does that exist 
somewhere. Mm -hmm. Like, is that lost media? Is it really lost? Because mm -hmm. again, they had files of all of our voices doing the Pokemon that then all got redone. But mm -hmm. do those files exist? Like, can we ever access them? Where's Funky Cops? Like, <laughs> I. I want to find all this old stuff. Yeah, it could yeah, be, yeah. Well, some I mean, of the, think... and some of the only ways you can even see these shows at all. I hate to say this, but it, like because some of them didn't get like DVD releases or even full releases of their shows. Some of the like Tokyo Mew Mew or Mew Mew Power is yeah. It was called. Like the only the only way you can even see the dubs of that show is like the the like. TiVo recordings that somebody have uploaded to like pirate websites and stuff, which that's kind of right. a bummer, but like that's all there is of an archive of those things. Well, slowly so. some things are getting re released, like uh, Fighting Food on just got a DVD release. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, there's something, so I'm hoping it kind of gets bigger than that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, she wasn't gonna say, ah, um, I don't remember. But it's yeah, gone. no, I it's it's I hate thinking it's gone, gone. Oh, I know. I was going I was trying to watch the old One Piece and there it, there's nowhere to legally watch the four kids One Piece episodes. Yeah, and Plus honestly, I... even finding like archives of those. I remember there was one episode I tried to hunt down cuz there was a character that Erica Schroeder got miscredited for that um Shannon, what is her last name? Damn it. Uh, I can't remember her last I name. I don't but, know. Or, uh, no, 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 not Shannon. No, uh, Ava Kaminsky, I think, was her name, that she played. <laughs> I don't and, remember and, any and, of these. Okay. And Erica was like, oh, that's not me. That's this the, a friend of mine. Da, 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 da. And I had to, like, search so hard to even find this. It was, like, one of the later episodes, like, in the hundreds or something, because they did quite a few of those, too. But, it, yeah, it was. It's 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 a bizarre thing, and there's such a small number i know steve is one of those people that like a, a, just a small amount of folks that even care enough to go looking for these things at all yeah uh, oh oh my god he's, he's an so. encyclopedia of this stuff it's so crazy um for a show that i just did i, I didn't even know who played who on that show yeah. like i <laughs> we were so, so at it like because you'd go and you'd do your stuff and you'd go and maybe you ran down the hall and did something else like again it was all just a jumble of one big episode and again it wasn't to be disrespectful to the material it was just the working condition it was the way we worked and the speed at which we worked yeah you um you mentioned a little while ago about i know we're, we're getting close to time here but the, god there's so much i want to talk to you about jesus christ <laughs> uh and you're a joy uh the shut up the, you are uh, Lamau, um going to cons and stuff not not that this, it's specifically about that but just I, I was gonna ask what is what is a life what is a day in the life of Tara Sands today in terms of, you know, or, or what, what's a regular week like for you now in terms of like just your day to day and everything that you've got going on? Cause you've got independent stuff you're producing with the podcast and you've got your, your LA Loops um, store as well. I imagine <laughs> you're doing you. auditions all the time and just all these things, you know, et cetera. Well, I mean, I think you know this too. It's like kind of piecemeal. Like it's like our, our schedules are a little bit of a jigsaw puzzle. Um, and a, like, so I kind of, I, I usually have an audiobook that I'm working on at any given time, hopefully. I mean, and, and, and knock on everything. Right now I am busy with like a series. So it's sort of slotting that in, in between auditions, um, the podcast interviews, uh, video game stuff. Um, the strike is going on right now. So those are the only kinds of projects I can really work on. Yeah, well, there's yeah. some, and then the dubs. Uh, mm -hmm. My dub work is a lot less. A lot of that I'm, I'm doing, I still have stuff I'm working on, but a lot of that uh, work is just not in LA anymore, unfortunately. Um, so it's a lot less dub work than I would like. I really do enjoy dubbing. I, I, and I do like a lot of live action dubbing. Um, and I actually really enjoy that. I know not every actor likes it. You and um, I were in a show together, a live action dub, my favorite what do we do? that I've ever done. It was an Italian show uh, with Todd Haberkorn called Sabura. Oh yeah, yeah. Yes, and I, I I'm like. I, to, what was the name me, of the character in that? I'm trying to oh, remember. Oh, I have no idea. But, but she was I, she was the cop woman with the short kind of blonde hair. Um, yeah, well, that was that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. But yeah. I feel like it's the closest to to my favorite kind of as an act. Like when I, when I work on camera, I love my favorite style of acting is real is subtle television yeah. acting. Like I got yeah. to work on a sort Aaron Sorkin show, and like yeah, I. If I if I had my druthers, like I that's what I would be doing every day. Mm -hmm. I think. Um, and you know, it's just stylistically what I enjoy. Yeah, um, I also absolutely. think it's the, for me, it's the biggest challenge. So mm -hmm. I think that's why I like it. Um, it's maybe that 
that's flip flopped for someone else. Um, so the live action dubbing to me feels the most like that. Mm -hmm. I but, uh, when when the show itself that it is it can be tiring and a little draining for me personally, but. I, I get over it when, like, the show is really, really, or the or movie is really, really cool, and I just get so invested yeah. in, like, because it's like you're watching it while you're doing it, too, and you're kind of, like, you know, as, as the story is unfolding, and they don't tell you what's going to happen later on. Totally, um, and that's, yeah. like, the kind of stuff I watch in my free time. Like, I yeah. can't, unfortunately, I can't watch anime for fun. It's oh. because it feels like work. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm watching, like, heavy dramas, or, like, that that will be dubbing from other languages, and uh, yeah, so that to me is is, is cool mm -hmm. when it's something I would actually put on to watch. But well, again, I can't watch my own, so no, and I and I get that. Yeah, it's you know because you don't want you're, you're your own worst critic every time. Um, last question I have for you. Uh, I know that the, there's always at every convention there's the the typical like how do I get into voice acting, et cetera, et cetera, kind of thing. Of course, mm -hmm. um, what I what I have often tried to do with these uh, this series of little interviews that I've been doing um, the last few years is that I always like to phrase it as say you're giving advice to somebody who is already in the business, you know, some of our contemporaries who want to boost themselves to the next level that may, maybe say they're doing like they're doing dubbing and you know some jrpgs and non-union stuff and things like that and they want to get to the point where like i want to be doing like lots of domestic animation i want to be doing you know triple a video games and commercials and things like that what to someone who is already in that world and trying to improve themselves what is what what's what's something that you would advise to actors that are already uh, in the business and, and trying to ascend to the next level? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. My, my advice is, is that when you take class, first of all, I know classes are expensive and I, I see a lot of people teaching classes that I, I don't necessarily shouldn't be. Think should, yeah. And, and not shouldn't be, but <laughs> not, no, no. And shouldn't be is the wrong thing, wrong thing to say, because you can get something different from every voiceover class you sure, take. Sure. Sure. Fair enough. But, and I think there's plenty of classes that teach you voice acting techniques and things like that. Mm -hmm. What I think people need to focus on, especially if they're already at a certain level, is taking classes on the business of this all. Because the business changes constantly. I have trouble keeping up with the changes, the trends, what's, what's you know, being cast, what's not, what they want in an audition. So like I signed up for some classes recently, some one-on-one -on -one sessions with people who actually cast these jobs. Like I don't trust other actors to know if they're only, if they do multiple jobs, that's fine. If they're also producing or casting, but mm -hmm. um, an act, uh, me as just an actor, I don't know what goes into decision-making. I don't mm -hmm. know what they want to hear in an audition. So I've done some coaching sessions recently where we didn't even read copy. We just discussed the industry and what they want to hear and what they think I can do to get farther ahead. And, um, you know, they, they listen to some of my auditions. They're like, yeah, yeah, I mean, your, your reading is is good. Like, here's a couple things you can do to improve. And, um, but a lot of it is just time, place, and the right character at the right moment. Um, and, under, and just understanding the numbers game of this all and and taking classes from the people who are actually making decisions. I, I would much rather somebody save their money and not take a class with someone just because they, they idolize them, but take yeah. a class with someone who actually makes the, if they're serious about this, because again, again, I, these classes are really expensive. I, yeah. I, yeah, I don't, I don't want to just tell people like obviously study and, you know, do your work, but there's also lots of free things you can do to hone your craft. You can do free practice groups with friends. Mm -hmm. um, you could all chip in to get a coach together. There's, there's great ways to, be economical about it. Yeah, no, for sure. I th and, I, and I think that when it comes to, because you're right, I've, I've taken a lot of classes, since, especially since I moved out here. And I think that doing your research and like, okay, who who am I going to benefit the most from if I'm going to spend, you know, several hundred dollars usually on a class, who am I going to benefit the most from, you know, learning yeah. from in the first place? And even, you know, when it comes to people who are decision makers, some of the ones that do do classes, like getting in front of them and even judging, I, I would even add to that, if you're going to get in front of like a casting director or a voice director uh, and, you know, you want to make a good impression on them, you know, in a class, 
make sure that you're at a level of skill to where you're going to yeah. deliver and they will remember you for good reasons at that point. Yeah. So. I mean, listen, I think it's even like if you're going to get really into it, like I would do a class with that same person three times mm -hmm. so that they see you getting better than I would in diversifying your money to three different people who will yeah. probably forget you. Yeah. That person after three times is going to remember you and be like, oh, shit, they're they're reading better than they were. Yeah. Uh, um, I, yeah, I, I've seen savvy. that happen. I've, I've seen, I remember in my early days of, of being out here, I took classes with Robbie Damon, uh, with some, with some different, you know, directors and, and, and now he, he's gone on to work with them on many, many, many things, which goes to show you. And I mean, yeah. he was already fantastic when he started. So, um, totally. And like, yeah. I, I think there's a lot of people that are like, what I'm working, why would I take a class? It's like, no, you can't know everybody. And there's always room for improvement. So At, you, and, know, you and gotta to humble evolve, yourself. And to evolve yeah. too as things change. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, cool. Hey, uh, well, that's, uh, that's going to wrap us up. Thank you for this. Um, Thank you. That was fun. Yeah. So you're, what, what are you, you're generally on I know Twitter, you're Tara Sands LA, right? Uh, no, I'm. T I changed it all. I know it's confusing. No, it's fine. at Tara Sands Vo now. Vo Vo, gotcha. On okay. all the different things. Gotcha. Uh, all the places. Where and so uh, your Etsy store is Looped LA, right? <laughs> Looped LA. Right. Yeah, okay. I, I haven't put as much time into that lately, but we I do all kinds of like Dungeons and Dragons, uh, dice inspired jewelry. I've seen. They're very cool. <laughs> um, and where yeah. can we find your podcast as well? Four Kids Flashback, wherever you find podcasts. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure when this is going to air. Um, hopefully our website will be up and running soon. Fourkidsflashback.com. Uh, yeah. Cool. For all your four kids' needs. <laughs> Brought to you directly from someone who is in every one of those shows. So. <laughs> <laughs> not, awesome. not everyone. I, I've been trying to figure out. I think... Maybe Veronica might be the one who's been in every, every single show. show. Somebody, yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. I know. I have to get to. I have to do more deep digging Good to Lord. figure that out. Uh, well, everybody, please go follow Tara on all of those things. I'll have a link in the description. Um, I uh, my next guest is a little up in the air. Uh, might be my last one. We'll see. Um, but there's <laughs> many more, and go uh, check out the previous one with Brina Palencia. That was right before this too. Uh, thank you all so much. Keep talking pretty, and we'll see you on the next one. Take care.